You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Chapter Leadership Committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jeremy. Today is June 23rd, 2021, and this is a special edition of Lighthearted. We're going to talk with three guests about the Hudson Athens Lighthouse on the Hudson River in New York. They're facing a bit of an emergency situation there with the deteriorating condition of the lighthouse's foundation. So let's get right into the introduction, Cindy. In the late 1860s, the hazard known as the Middle Ground Flats opposite the city of Hudson, New York in the Hudson River, made navigation in the busy shipping route treacherous. An appropriation of $35,000 was approved by Congress in 1872 to build the Hudson Athens Lighthouse. The lighthouse went into service in late 1874. It was run by a resident keeper until it was automated in the 1950s. It still serves as an aid to navigation, guiding ships safely around the middle ground flats. In 1967, New York's Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller established the Hudson River Valley Commission to explore possible uses for the Hudson River's lighthouses. The commission recommended that the Coast Guard transfer or lease the facilities to groups that would rehabilitate, maintain, and operate the facilities for public benefit. In 1982, a group of local citizens formed the Hudson Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society. Since then, with the help of private donations, public grants, and legislative initiatives, the Preservation Society has undertaken the analysis and mitigation of structural, aesthetic, interpretive, and public access issues that face the property. Restoration efforts have focused on the 1930s and 1940s when Keeper M.L. Brunner and his family lived at the lighthouse. In 2020, the Preservation League of New York State released its biennial Seven to Save list, highlighting the most at-risk historic sites in the state, and Hudson Athens Lighthouse was included on the list. Recent efforts have mostly focused on shoring up the foundation of the structure. That effort, along with smaller projects, is expected to cost more than $1 million. A grant from the Preservation League of New York State earlier this year is supporting an engineering study of the lighthouse. Another issue the organization has faced in recent years is the failure of the power cable that provided electricity for the lighthouse. Uh, I photographed the Hudson Athens Lighthouse back in uh, 2008 when I was, I was working on a book on New York Harbor and Hudson River Lighthouses. Unfortunately, I was not able to actually get to the lighthouse or inside it, but I was able to get good views of it from both uh, sides of the river, from Hudson and Athens. And it's really a beautiful lighthouse. I think one of the the prettiest lighthouses around. Uh, So let me tell you about today's guests. Van Calhoun is chair of the Hudson Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society's Foundation Renovation Committee. Bob Taylor is the historian for the society. And Bill Palmer is a volunteer and boat captain. I spoke with all three of them recently. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with Van Calhoun, Bill Palmer, and Bob Taylor of the Hudson Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society in New York. Thank you so much for being with me today, Bob, Bill, and Van. Good to be. Thank Good you. to be here. I really appreciate it. So uh, Van and Bill, it's nice to meet you. Bob, I've known you for years. I'm not sure how many years, but quite a few. We were even in Scotland and England together on a U.S. Lighthouse Society tour in 2017. And I also want to thank Carol Gans, who's the president of your organization, for her help in setting this up. L- let me just start with a, a question for any of you, okay? You can fight amongst yourselves for who's going to answer this, but it seems like the lighthouse is mostly known as the Hudson Athens Lighthouse. That's how I see it most often referred to. It's also uh, referred to in, in some places as the, as the Hudson City Lighthouse. Is one name more correct than the other? Maybe Bob wants to answer that. What they tend to do is when you put a lighthouse in the middle of the river, they tend to name it with respect to which side of the uh, shipping channel it's on. Well, originally the shipping channel was over in Athens. Lighthouse is out in the middle. So Hudson is the side that is um, the name for the lighthouse. So it becomes the Hudson City. But then somewhere, and that was in 1874 when it was set up. But then at some point, the Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for maintaining the uh, depth of the uh, rivers and also harbors and things like that. They looked at dredging it because they no longer were uh, deep enough to accommodate the boat traffic. And evidently, they decided what was below water on the Athens side was not to take out, better to dig it out on the Hudson side. 
-hmm. So now all of a sudden, and after all these a uh, decade or two, the channel now switches over next to Hudson. Now the uh -huh. lighthouse never moved. And it, so it now would be called the Athens Lighthouse because it's now next to Athens with respect to the shipping channel. Mm -hmm. That did not go over locally uh, too well with some of the folks. I'll let you think about which city or town didn't like that. Right. So in the end, the compromise was the, uh, the Hudson Athens. But mm -hmm. anybody that says, well, I'm not quite sure that's right. All you got to do is look at the building. When they built it, the tower, the, the square tower four-sided, it is facing Athens. And they always put it facing the shipping channel. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, they couldn't move the lighthouse around, rotate it 180 degrees. I know you live in Pittsfield, Mass., which is in western Massachusetts. How did you happen to get involved with the Hudson Athens Lighthouse? Well, I, I developed a guilty conscience. I started photographing lighthouses about 25 years ago. And I noticed whenever I went, um, there would be somebody who would say, I'm a volunteer here. And I'm thinking, hmm, these people aren't getting paid. And even to the point of uh, Coast Guard people in uniform, they would say, well, I'm just volunteering, and I'm thinking, oh. And then I can remember this young man up in Portland had at the top in the lantern room. He said to me, you know, I, have, I only work five days a week. I have two days off. He said, I don't mind volunteering one day. And I'm thinking, I'm just sponging on all these volunteers. So I began to look around, and I live uh, a 1,000 feet above sea level, so we don't have too many lighthouses up here where I live. Mm -hmm. And I never even knew they had lighthouses in the Hudson River. And the closest one to my house is the Hudson Athens. And that literally is an hour drive for me, but I can yeah. go over an hour, a two hour meeting and drive home an hour uh, yeah. to volunteer up the coast of Maine or, or even Portsmouth, New Hampshire. You know, <laughs> I, I spend more time driving than, than working. So that's yeah. how I kind of ended up. I kind of knew that, that you're not that far from there, but for people listening, they might not be familiar with the geography, but Hudson River is not far from Western Massachusetts. So uh, let's talk about the history of the lighthouse. Uh, Bob, why was it built in the first place? Well, it, just north of the um, the lighthouse, um, there, it, there was a sandbar. Now, those of us that have been to the beach know that when the tide comes in, the sandbar is covered, but when the tide goes out, you can walk along on the sandbar. And what happened was... Um, the, the Hudson River is a tidal river, and it goes up and down slightly all the way up to Troy and Albany, um, New York. Now, everybody seems to have their titanic moment when one of these things goes wrong. And for us, it was the uh, swallow. Uh, this was a big dayliner. And in um, 1845, this thing after dark was flying up the river in November, and it got caught on the sandbar because it didn't realize where it was. Unfortunately, a wooden boat, it actually split too, so it took on water a little faster. And in those days, they didn't keep track of manifest lists of actually who was on there. So they're estimating somewhere between 10 to 25 people lost their life. I mean, people on either shore could build a bonfire, and if you could swim across the cold water in November, you might make it. And they came out with rowboats and stuff, but, you know, that, that's not a, a good evacuation situation. So this is now uh, 1845 when it smashed up. People on both sides said, Congress, we need a lighthouse. Almost 30 years later, 1874, they actually turned the light on in November, first time for the Hudson Athens Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, it's still um, an active aid to navigation. It's green. So as you're going up the river, it should be on your left-hand side. So, so that's what did it. Now, the other thing that became a major player is, if you think about it, if, if you were interested in in going over to India, uh, China, getting spices and all that stuff, you know, putting that stuff on a camel and taking it up over the mountains to uh, England, France, et cetera, didn't go over too well. So they were going down the coast of uh, Africa, trying to find a water route. And lo and behold, in 1609, Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson River and right. it really wasn't out of whack. He was trying to go left and get over to India. Obviously, he was lucky to get his boat turned around and back down the river. So that, that's what kind of came a, a focus. But the, the real thing was the vision of the people who decided they could build a canal from Buffalo to Albany, New York, or Troy, the Erie Canal. And when mm -hmm. they opened that to, in 1825, there was no question that if you're going to make a buck on the spices, boy, you can get up there and you can go out there and you could be trading fur with the, uh, the Indians out there on the Great Lakes and stuff. And there's another opportunity for commerce. Yeah. And of course, when you start putting bigger and more boats racing on the same 
water thing, it's the same thing as a highway. You have bigger and better accidents and mishaps on why you need to. So if you look at the lighthouses in the Hudson River, so many of them were put in in the 1800s because yeah. that's before the railroads really came in and kind of yeah. uh, rerouted things. Right. And the Hudson River was an extremely yeah. important waterway yep. during that, that period. Yeah. Bill and Van, I'm, I'm not forgetting about you. I'm going to get to you in a few minutes, but I just want to talk a little bit more with Bob about the, the history. What about the architecture of the building? It's it's similar to some other lighthouses, but um, maybe unique in some ways. What, uh, what can you tell me about the architecture? Well, they refer to it actually as the Second Empire style building for those people that are into to all that style stuff. Basically, I would describe it to the person that hasn't been there. It's a brick house, two stories high, and it's basically four rooms over four rooms mm -hmm. is what it is. And then in the corner, what they put are limestone blocks. So it kind of sets it off. It isn't the red brick coming, you know, from two sides and just meeting. So that's what they did. Now, on the, um, the second story, what they did is they tipped in the roof. So instead of going straight up, they tipped it in maybe about 30 degrees on three sides. And instead of putting on uh, paint and stuff like that, they actually put on slate, which is the same slate they put on the old time churches when you got a slate roof and it went for 100 years, you know, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And by tipping it in like that now on three sides of the building, it catches an awful lot of rainwater normally than what we would catch in our house with our, our little gutters. Now, the gutters aren't what we've got on our house, you know, about four inches. They're over a foot wide, these gutters. So mm -hmm. that catches the rainwater. Yeah. And there are two downspouts so that once the, um, the water looks like it's running clean, there are flappers that can go up and down. Yeah. Then you tip them up and you put the water in a cistern in the basement, which holds 6,500 gallons. So yeah. you can see that holds an awful lot of water. Now, as far as the tower goes, um, it's just a uh, four-sided brick building that goes up way above the second story, mm -hmm. uh, which is why when they move the shipping channel, it's up high enough so you can see it from both sides. So it's really not a problem from navigation <laughs> point of view. And that's where the lantern room is, up there. And yep. then the top of the second story is just a tar paper roof, like they often put on school buildings, you know, just uh -huh. tar. Uh -huh. and, and that works fine. Yeah. That works yeah. fine. Now, in terms of similar lighthouses, People often say if, if we have a cousin or something, it's stepping stones. That's down in New York Harbor. Yep. Um, if you look at that building real close down there, you will see that it, it at least from the pictures I've seen at the multiple sides, it doesn't have any windows on the second floor. Mm. Um, but you'd have to be, you know, in and out of ours all the time to realize, particularly when the windows don't open too well, you realize how many windows we got to open and close on a hot day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I notice I didn't mention the word bathroom. <laughs> it had an yeah. outhouse sure. overhanging the Hudson River. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's typical for offshore lighthouses on right. fresher salt water. Yeah. You didn't have to teach the kids to flush each time either. It right. Was, Reminds me of yeah. the lighthouse, uh, Portland Breakwater Light, <laughs> Lighthouse in Portland, Maine, where one of the kids who grew up there said, uh, talked about what an adventure it would be to go out to that outdoor bathroom overhanging the harbor in a, when there was a storm going on and the wind whipping up underneath you. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, he said you tried to time it according to the wind and tides. You know, you, you paid attention to the weather and tried your best to time it. But that's, that's probably enough of that subject. <laughs> yeah, I know. And in terms of the actual building, they tended to make them all out of local materials. Mm -hmm. Unless you got to one of those spark plugs where they could stamp them out in a foundry and assemble them. You know, right. right. So basically, you got red bricks that were made locally in the area. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, the uh, limestone is still to this day being mined. Uh, they they will park a barge over on the Hudson waterfront, um, and they will load it up with this crushed white stone. Mm -hmm. And when it gets full, uh, a tugboat will show up, and off it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So that area is just um, has a lot of uh, mining in it. Did the, uh, in its early days, I know there were some problems with ice early on. Did the lighthouse operate all, all year round in its early years, Bob? Well, the answer is yes and no, depending what early years are. Um, yeah. Initially, it was a good deal because um, in the wintertime, the, uh, the river froze solid. You couldn't uh, navigate up and down it. The Coast Guard didn't have uh, anything like uh, icebreakers in those days back in the 1800s. So basically, the uh, lighthouse keeper got the monthly check. And what are you going to do? I mean, you can't paint the outside of the house in November and December and January. So what many of these folks did is they actually went out and got a job cutting ice 
on the Hudson River. And I've actually seen on, on uh, public television these uh, black and white films where they, they would have a ramp like a conveyor belt and they would put the block of ice there and go right up the conveyor belt very close to shore. They have like barns and uh -huh. they would pile all these blocks of ice in there with sawdust in between. And in the summertime, they would take the blocks, put them on a boat and send them down New York City. And today we would call that a refrigeration. But, th yeah. but that's really uh, what they did. So the lighthouse keeper, in a sense, could moonlight, and that would be perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, what else could they really do? I mean, they could polish the brass work on the railings or something inside, but there, there wasn't much you, uh, else you could do. Yeah. Now, it started to change. So that depends on your definition of early. In 1934, there's actually a letter that somebody has dug up in Xerox, and it's in the lighthouse there under a um, piece of uh, plastic. But in 1934, the district superintendent in charge of the Hudson River and probably all of Long Island, many other things, wrote a letter to each lighthouse keeper saying the day liners, now these are, are actually uh, steamboats. So um, they, they tended to, to run, uh, they are going to try to run all winter long up the river. The word was you, the lighthouse keeper, don't do any thinking. You light the light every night and it's somebody else's problem, you know. So starting in 1934, you're now responsible for 365 yeah. for your light being lit. Uh, was there also a fog signal there? Yes. Um, and this is very interesting. If you listen carefully to the name of the company, you can see where this came from. Uh, they put in a fog bell was their signal as opposed to other choices, no cannons. In 1894, there was a company in New York City called the Gamwell Fire Alarm and Telegraph Company. Yeah. That's what the company made. And what they did is they installed a uh, fog bell that could be set time-wise in terms of how often it rang per minute. And the best way to describe this, because most people have never seen one of these things, is to think of a grandfather clock. The weights come down, you wind them up, and they come back down, and that's what makes the hands turn. Well, in our case, you wind up the weights, but the weights are probably 50 to 75 pounds. They're not just, you know, small weights. Uh, and they go up about two and a half stories in the building. Yeah. And there's actually a tube um, that you can see on the first floor if you open the, if you know what door, you open this little trap door in the wall, there's where the lights, uh, weights come down through. And what they did is they set that up. Now, this piece of equipment that, that, made out of solid metal with great big gears. And it's um, not something you want to fool with because you can put your fingers between the gears and it, be, it could become dangerous. But um, that thing there really has what I would call a sludge hammer because people have a sludge hammer with maybe a 10 pound weight on the bottom and maybe a, a three foot or more uh, wooden handle. The yeah. only difference is this sludge hammer is a wooden arm, uh, a metal arm and a metal. And that thing will just wallop that bell up on the top yeah. Every um, 15 seconds. So if it's a foggy day and you can't see the um, light and you can't see the lighthouse, you at least hear the sound. The other point to just remember is that in terms of electricity, it didn't come till 1946. So all the while it was occupied by um, lighthouse families, um, that was the uh, fog belt. Now, yeah. when you come out there today, you will see a, um, I use the word newer, probably 1950s bell or something. When the Coast Guard came, they put a second bell down on the deck. And if you look underneath, it looks to me like a solenoid. Mm -hmm. But in um, 19 years, I've been volunteering there. I've never seen the thing work. So I think it was unhooked years ago uh -huh. in terms okay. of that. And it just, we just operate with the light. We don't have a fog bell. Sure. Okay. Bill, I think you, you, maybe you had something to add. Was there also a, a fog horn uh, after the bell there? Uh, there was. Uh, I remember that from the 1960s uh, and before. I, I know it did operate during the 50s as well, and I believe into the early 1970s. And of course, it was, it was used at a time largely after there was no one living there. So it was actually turned on and off from a switch over in Athens. Okay. Probably by somebody they would refer to as a lamplighter. They, they used to hire local people to serve as so-called lamplighters who didn't necessarily light the lamp. Some of them operated fog signals. 
So, Bob, I just one more question about the history for now, and we'll move on to some other subjects. But the lighthouse, as I understand it, was a, always a family station. You had, uh, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a single keeper and his family living there until it was automated. Are there any particular stories or facts about the keepers and families that live there that really stand out for you? Well, it's interesting because up until uh, 2017, we actually had Emily Bruner, who lived there as a child from 1930 to 36. She never missed a tour, whether it was a second graders or adults. And she would have all of them just eating out of her hand. I mean, they just couldn't. They kept asking another question, another question. So she would tell some very interesting stories. Um, yeah. But uh, one of them was that when she was probably, I don't know, six, seven years old, whatever, her father said to her, your mother's going to have a baby any minute now. I got to go get the doctor in Athens. I'm taking the boat over. You help your mother. It's just a child now. And when she comes back, her brother, Bob, had been born and Emily was the helper. Mm-hmm. And she later went on to go to New York City and study to be a nurse and worked in the operating room uh, at the hospital for a number of years before she became a school nurse, decided that might be a little bit easier. Uh, But she would tell stories, you know, if if the kids, naturally they like to go up and down the ladder on the side of the uh, foundation. So they would go down and sit on the stones. Well, you had to watch those dayliners because when they came up, they threw a swell out in such a way that it washed you right off little kids, you know. So she had to uh, be careful and watch what she was doing. Yeah, yeah. As a a former school teacher, what I found interesting is I read this little reference. Do you realize now that um, in the summertime, you get in a boat and you go over to Athens because they didn't provide you with a teacher. So the children went over to Athens to school. And then at the end of the day, they got a boat ride back out to the lighthouse. Well, in the winter, you walked across the ice. And what happened was her father used to chew tobacco and he used to spit it out. Uh, so they would just follow the marks on the ice and they knew that was pretty safe because dad didn't fall through and that's the way he went. Mm -hmm. So they would go back and forth across. But the interesting thing I found was uh, it seems like the superintendent of schools spoke to the family that uh, they were not too happy about the children's attendance because if you think about it in in March, uh, April, depending on how the seasons are changed, you have a certain period of time in which you have blocks of ice. I mean, the size of a small Volkswagen or even, you know, going up and down the river. Um, you can't walk on that and you certainly can't take a wooden boat through. So yeah. you can't actually go to school. So while I used to, as a kid, say, oh, geez, we'll get a snow day now. Look at the snow. They'd probably get a, a snow week, you know, with the ice, you know, and sure. that kind of stuff. So what they used to try to do is find a family or relative or something where they get could you take my child for the week and then we'll pick them up again for the weekend. Uh, Mm -hmm. So they go to school all week, but evidently they did have some misses because the superintendent is reported to have visited the family and they had to have a discussion about that. So that becomes a challenge for them. That's a little different from some of the, the saltwater lighthouses offshore where the children uh, or maybe the father rode them back and forth every day to go to school again uh, was the situation is totally different when it's blocked by ice it's not like they right. had any choice yeah. in the matter yeah okay. so bob maybe you can fill in a little bit of the history of uh, how the uh, the lighthouse uh, the hudson athens lighthouse preservation society came to be originally now what actually happened with the lighthouse is starting in uh, if you if you look at the brunner family they moved there in 1930, and in 1936, the family went off and lived in Athens. But Emil, the lighthouse keeper, was there until 49, and he was one of those folks that actually joined the Coast Guard. So in 1949, he retired uh, from the Coast Guard, and that was the time at which the Coast Guard was going through and automating the lighthouses and basically removing the personnel. So I guess what happened is somewhere along the line there, one of the lighthouses evidently was demolished or somebody was going to demolish one because today there's only half as many lighthouses as there once was back in, in uh, the early 1900s. So um, they went to Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor at the time, and said, well, you got to do something about this. So typical, um, Nelson sets up a uh, Hudson River Valley Commission to study the problem. What are we going to do with this whole river and the lighthouses, et cetera? And their recommendation was in 1966, when it came out, turn the lighthouses over to nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And that was 66. In 82 is when the Hudson Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society um, was formed. And that goes back before my time. 
Uh, and that is a 501c3 organization. Mm -hmm. And when that thing went uh, and opened up, uh, the deal was that you've got to basically maintain the building, uh, open it to the public. And we have every year we have four Saturday open houses for the public that are yep. published. You can make a reservation and come out. Uh, the second graders come out on a school field trip from Athens, Kosaki, and in the uh, city of Hudson. Uh, and we also uh, have uh, private events that people charter, like for weddings and stuff like that. So we do all that. And, and uh, that, that is all, again, all staffed at our end by volunteers. None of us get mm -hmm. paid. Mm -hmm. The boat, of course, is a commercial operation. The, the employees of the boat are paid, but that's a different matter. So that's what we're doing to maintain it. But, on, on, you know, you can't get enough money out of second graders and four Saturdays, you know, in a few events to pay for rebuilding the foundation or whatever you have to do. Yeah. So that becomes our challenge. But I want to move on uh, to Bill here. You've been uh, involved with boating around that area all your life. And also your family uh, had quite a heritage, was known for building river boats and so forth. Could you maybe say a little bit more about your family's history on the, on the Hudson River around there? Sure. Well, I'm not sure there are any builders there, but um, my, uh, my great, great grandfather, uh, was a captain on the Hudson River Day Line. And from the early 1890s through, I think, 1900, he was the captain of the steamship New York. Uh, and the New York and its sister ship, Albany, uh, one would leave New York, one would leave Albany in the morning, and they'd pass uh, one another somewhere around mid-river. And the next morning, the trip, same trip would take place in reverse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and my family has always been involved with the river. Uh, I've been boating on the river since I was a little kid. You know, of course, growing up in Athens, I knew Emily and I knew her brother, Bob, uh, uh, pretty well. So the lighthouse was always part of the boating community out here. Yeah. And I, of course, knew Bill Nestlin. He was the, I guess you, the term you used was lamplighter. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Bill uh, and his family and his wife, Vi, was very involved with the Lighthouse Society. But Bill, uh, Bill Nestlin was the one who would um, uh, turn on the fog signals and, you know, weather permitting. In the winter, he'd go out to the lighthouse by ice boat. You know, the rest of the year, he'd go out by, uh, by a regular boat, just go in and check things and make sure everything was in working order. So as you mentioned, Bill, you've uh, been boating around there your, your whole life. And how, what led you to get involved with the lighthouse group? Well, again, I think uh, knowing the organization, you know, from the time it was formed and then you know, as the years went by and my kids were getting older, they uh, they actually started to volunteer on the lighthouse uh, as part of school groups. I think they first went out there on uh, on school tours. Then eventually, um, I think Carol always complained, you know, they volunteered in the lighthouse and then they actually got a job with a local uh, tour boat company. Yeah. Uh, so the tour boat company stole away a couple of Carol's volunteers, I guess, was uh, uh, the way it happened. But they... Uh, you know, worked with the lighthouse tours for a number of years, you know, and I filled in periodically helping out with those things. And then uh, when I when I retired from my day job a couple of years ago, I became what eventually turned out to be almost a full time volunteer. <laughs> um, you know, that first year, just uh, I, because of my background, I uh, I was put in charge of the uh, the lighthouse uh, work boat and still doing the same and helping out in different areas as necessary. Well, it sounds like a, sounds like a good fit and an organization like, like yours needs, obviously needs somebody like you who knows uh, how to handle a boat uh, and get stuff out there. So I think you were involved uh, with this bill to some degree, but what happened with the power cable in 2019, the cable that provided power to the lighthouse? Well, I think as Bob mentioned, uh, the lighthouse was electrified back in the late 1940s. And, you know, those, you know, that power cable has been under the river probably since that time. Yeah. And we know it had two circuits and one of the circuits went bad a number of years ago, but we were still able to um, uh, function. And then one day we went out there and I believe it was August of 2019 and threw the switch and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And we did some checking and. Uh, sure enough, the cable was uh, the cable was dead. Yeah. So we scrambled quite a bit. Um, came up with a two-tiered solution. Initially, we uh, purchased a small generator 
which, you know, with some volunteer electricians, um, you know, that we knew, uh, we were able to wire it in. And we could, of course, use that generator whenever we were out there, whether it was for public tours or work details, whatever the case might be, in order to provide whatever electrical power we needed. The other thing, and I think it was, you know, one of the, uh, one of the longstanding traditions, um, you know, going back uh, almost three decades, was we would light up the lighthouse with holiday lights yeah. uh, in December. And of course, the generator uh, only works when you're there. Mm -hmm. So we had to come up with another solution in order to continue uh, with that holiday light tradition, which was, which was very important to all of us. Yeah. Uh, so again, using volunteers, um, uh, we designed, purchased the materials and installed a solar array. You know, fortunately, the way the lighthouse is situated, the south side of the lighthouse is pointing almost directly true south. Um, so, you know, that was very convenient for us, uh, but we lugged in batteries, um, did the wiring and it worked. So is that, is that that or what more needs to be done as far as the, the power goes? Well, this past year, we, uh, we added an additional panel. So we have roughly uh, one and a half kilowatts of uh, uh, generating capacity and we added two additional uh, large batteries. Uh, so that the system for our normal electrical needs, you know, for example, when we have public tours, uh, running all the lights, uh, electric fan, running video equipment, more than enough power to do that. And, you know, obviously more than enough power to run, you know, thousands of holiday lights, you know, whatever we would choose to put up. Yeah. Uh, this year, we're probably going to uh, increase the capacity of uh, one of the components within the system that will allow us to, for a short period of time, use some higher draw electrical appliances and perhaps some power tools mm -hmm. uh, without having to use the generator. Uh, but aside from that, I mean, we're, uh, we're never going to be running air conditioning and, uh, um, you know, heavy electric motors uh, with the system, but it's proven to be, you know, very adequate for, for what we need. I just did a, a podcast episode a couple of weeks ago with uh, somebody from the East Brother Island uh, Lighthouse in uh, San Francisco Bay. They've got a similar problem they're facing where they just lost the uh, their power cable uh, just very recently. So uh, I think it's something a lot of groups are going to be facing, obviously, as, as time goes on. Of course, a lot of lighthouses have been solar converted to solar power, but a lot of them to some degree still rely on these underwater cables that have some age on them now. So I'm sure other people will be facing that. Well, I'm sure um, Van mm -hmm. will mention too, as part of the underwater study, the divers did find the sheared cable under there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we kind of had a confirmation that, uh, you know, there was a, a, a bigger problem with the cable than we thought. So. Yeah. You say sheared cable. Was it just uh, wear and tear or was it, do you think it was actually severed by a boat or something like that? Uh, we believe it was part of the old granite riprap. You know, from mm -hmm. age and scour, some of the riprap uh, slid down. Okay. And quite honestly, the cable got caught between two pieces of it. And uh, uh, when it shifted and, you know, of course, broke the casing and broke one of the, uh, the circuits a number of years ago. And then I think through water intrusion, it just uh, took care of the rest of it. So Van, I, I hope you don't think we forgot about you here, <laughs> but I, I uh, want to ask you a couple of things. First of all, uh, you are the chair of the Foundation Renovation Committee. Obviously, a, a really important part of what the organization is uh, doing these days is really focused on. How did you come to be involved with that aspect of it? Well, I, I grew up in a town near Hudson, Chatham, New York. I've always known about the lighthouse and 35 years ago, just about when the Lighthouse Society started uh, its first uh, lease, they started an organization, and it turned out their first uh, president of the organization was a young guy. Um, there were many of the older volunteers who were also involved, but he took the responsibility of the president. He was an employee of mine. And he said one day, why don't you come down and see the Lighthouse? I can get you on board. We have a work day. And uh, Emily Brenner's going to be there, and really who everybody talks about. So that was 35 years ago. I went down. I really enjoyed it. I had a good day. met Emily. And um, then fast forward 32, 33 years, a busy family business, never had another opportunity to become involved. 
So like, well, I uh, left my day job a few years ago and uh, have been doing a lot of volunteering for different organizations and town committees and whatnot. We lost uh, Van and we hope to get him back, but I'm going to continue here and uh, hope that Van can rejoin us. But let me ask uh, any of you who might want to answer this. You've uh, talked about this to some degree already, but is, is there anything else we haven't talked about? What, what sorts of things do the volunteers get involved with there? Is there hands-on work projects with the volunteers at the Lighthouse? I think in terms of ongoing processes, you know, we kind of look at it uh, as a homeowner. You know your home always needs maintenance, upkeep, cleaning. We have the same issues with the Hudson Athens Lighthouse, uh, with the exception that we need a boat to get out there. Yeah. So we organize work details and there might be a painting that's done. Uh, we do have a local company that once a year they would come out uh, with a team of people and go through the uh, lighthouse to do a major cleaning for us. You know, we have staffing for the, the public tours. I think uh, Carol had mentioned at one point, we generally have in the neighborhood of about 14 people to fully staff uh, with volunteers for one of our public events. And that would be probably two people on each shore. We would have two people in our boat running volunteers and equipment back and forth. Uh, we'd have somebody on the dock uh, to assist people, uh, passengers, when they're brought out by the tour boat to, to get on the dock and up the stairs. And then uh, we, of course, have Bob Taylor, who is, who is generally the, the main tour guide, who provides background, a lot of information as people come through. And then there are generally people in each room and up on the tower. Mm -hmm. uh, as people are allowed access all the way up to the catwalk to walk around the uh, uh, the beacon, so yeah. you know it's a uh, you know the public events are generally in all hands on deck, and some days we have uh, just enough volunteers. Uh, other days we have too many volunteers. Um, if there is such a thing as too many volunteers, <laughs> right? I don't know if there is such a thing. You know, but it's just from the standpoint of allocating people around, and but it seems to work out very well. You know, we have a really great bunch of people that participate in many different ways. And what is the, what kind of schedule is there for public tours? I think Bob mentioned that uh, the second Saturday, July through October, okay, yeah. is probably the main public tour that we do. That runs from late morning through mid afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then we have various other special events, you know, might be private events for people who are interested in the lighthouse. Uh, there's a event that started last year called Waterfront Wednesdays in the city of Hudson, where we would uh, actually recruit volunteers on shore and using local tour boat, we would take people out to see the lighthouse. So there are a lot of different activities that are out there and New ones happen all the time. I know Carol gets a lot of phone calls about people who are interested in, in getting a private tour, whether it's for a family coming to town or, or whatever the case might be. So Van has rejoined us. Uh, we uh, lost you for a few minutes, Van, I think due to internet issues, but it's good to have you back. Can you, we'll talk uh, about the problems with the foundation, but first, can you describe the actual construction of the foundation? Uh, yeah, the... I guess it was common uh, at the time, and uh, indeed a lot of the harbors up the East Coast are built in a similar fashion. Piles were driven into the river bottom uh, as far as they could at the time with probably um, steam pile drivers. And uh, wooden piles, uh, somewhat close to 200 of them. And uh, on top of those wooden piles, they were uh, driven as deep as they could, were, were put uh, wooden floor joists. They were mounted right at the at the mud line or at the bottom of the river, mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that was that the mud is very important to have around all the timbers to uh, eliminate oxygen. Oxygen is uh, uh, what deteriorates the wood. So once that was done, on top of that were the granite blocks that you see out of the water. Riprap was put around the sides of the granite blocks to help uh, protect them, and then the building was put on top of it. And that's, uh, so that's what we have. And uh, I know uh, some things have been happening, not necessarily good things with the foundation recently. Uh, can you describe the present condition of the Lighthouse Foundation? 
I think probably starting somewhat after they switched the channels in the river and then after the Corps of Engineers deepened the channel and after we started getting bigger and bigger boats and indeed ocean going vessels go all the way to Albany, 30 miles north of us, us yet, uh, moving faster and faster, we've had a lot of current change in the river and um, we've suffered terrible scouring. So mm -hmm. when water's slushing along quickly, like when you take a garden hose and, and hose out a ditch, it digs a hole after a while. We've had scouring so bad on the east side where the channel is that it's actually pulled all of our riprap away and it's tumbled downhill, if you will, in the water a long ways from the lighthouse itself. And so that has allowed then the water to suck out the mud uh, underneath it and our pilings are now exposed quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, some of them five, six, seven feet. And there never used to be a channel on the west side. In fact, that Bill remembers this from a kid. It was 15 or 20 feet deep. And now we have a, a channel on the west side, also about 40 feet deep, uh, which has scoured the material away. So that's the biggest change. And we're, we've had cracking in the last 10 years. Bob Taylor referred to it. There were some repairs done to try to hold the, the foundations in place. But we've had sagging and cracking. And that's what we have to remedy. And maybe you can say a little bit about what's being done uh, in the name of uh, remedying that pro the problems, including, uh, I was reading about something called the LIDAR study. I don't know if you call it the LIDAR study, but uh, what is that exactly? Sure, yeah, the LIDAR study. LIDAR is, uh, has been around for a while. It's basically radar that's used by other things than airplanes, and it's been developed that it can be used underwater and run sideways underwater. So um, we, our engineer was able to, to, to use some very sophisticated new underwater survey equipment and teams. And they ran a boat around the lighthouse multiple times with this device in the water and they would ping it constantly. Mm -hmm. And in the computer age, we can take you know, thousands of points of data. So they would take more information, more information, more information. And when they put that together with applications, they could actually show all of those peers absolutely where they were, and they could even show where the material was or was not around them. Mm -hmm. they, they built a, a model from this that's fantastic and can be seen in a video that they did for us, which we have on the website. That's just mind-bogglingly descriptive and, and wonderful. And that has confirmed what we thought we had. We sent divers down uh, afterwards to do hands-on, and they were the same divers who were there 13 years ago. So they were able to tell us, yes, the, 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 the soil has been receding to the center of the lighthouse, and we have more exposure. So we know what our problem is very definitively, and therefore we know what we have to do. I understand during the course of that study, a, a sunken barge was actually discovered near the lighthouse. Is that correct? Yeah, the, uh, the survey team were interesting fellows. They really took a fancy to the lighthouse. They, they had never done a project like this with a lighthouse before. So they kind of turned the camera outwards as they went and they picked up some other things. So, so they picked up the frame of what ultimately we believe is, is a barge, barge, an old Hudson River type flat barge, long flat barge. Couple stories that I've heard about how those barges, and there are actually hundreds of them in the Hudson River. Uh, some were just... Uh, just sunk from uh, misuse or age. Some were um, sunk on purpose uh, to put stones and rocks and whatnot in. Um, it was suggested that maybe this was a work boat that was uh, used for the two years on the lighthouse and then it wasn't any good afterwards or it was lost. And there's even the suggestion that the boat building that went on in Athens, the Athens side of the river where they built hundreds of big river boats, um, if they had a fire, they would float these boats out in the water and let it burn off the dock. So mm -hmm. that was done fairly regularly too. Anyhow, it, it is there. So what is the status at this moment of the whole foundation renovation project? Where does it stand and what happens now? We've gotten good funding and application and recognition of our need uh, from, from agencies. And um, uh, we've hired our engineers to do all the information gathering, which is now done, uh, write up an assessment of that, which they have done. And now we're going into phase two of the, of, of the engineering part that they will be actually drawing the plan and reaching out to, to do the estimating for, for this project. We have a multiple uh, options from um, you know Volkswagen to Cadillac, I guess you'd say, that we could do a, a, 
a bare bones uh, protection, a 10 or 20 year plan, or we could do the 100 year plan. Um, the, the mindset of, of uh, Hudson, uh, Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society is that if we're gonna do this and do all this work, we need to do the 100 year plan. And so that's what's being put together. And um, we pretty much know what the ultimate plan is. And then it's gonna be a matter of affordability, whether we have to cut back on that and do less or a lot less. If we could have our druthers, uh, we would completely contain this lighthouse in a curtain wall. We have, a, we have a hundred foot diameter circle of ground. That's all we own under the Hudson River. We are the tiniest island there is. And, uh, and then we would infill it and we would be there forever. If we have to, we need to absolutely do the east side and some of the south and some of the north as well, and then put the rip ride back. So that's what we're looking for. And to, two and a half years ago, the minimum approach was priced at $2.2 million. And so we're looking at a four to $5 million project here to, to do it right over time. How can people donate to this cause? Uh, and so donations, um, there are several ways to go. On our homepage, right at the bottom of our homepage is a, a donate button, a please, and we are a 501c3. Yeah. Um, so it's down at the bottom of the left. Obviously, they could send the check to our address, Hudson yeah. Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society at P.O. Box 145, Athens, New York, 12015. And gee, at least go ahead and become a member. Yeah, yeah. Give us your minimum membership fee and then get, come out there and, and see our little lighthouse. What's the address of the website? Well, HudsonAthensLighthouse.org. Okay, that's easy. HudsonAthensLighthouse.org. All right. I have one final question for all three of you, and this is for bonus points. So I want you to sharpen your pencils here. What is your favorite part of your involvement with the Hudson Athens Lighthouse? And why don't we go back to, to Bob to start this? I enjoy meeting the people and talking with them. They can't believe that somebody actually lived out there and performed a useful function. And, and many of these people, sometimes you realize they're from Athens or Hudson. I mean, it's, they haven't come from New York City. They, they live in the area, but mm -hmm. they're fascinated with just seeing it. And I used to ask the little kids when the second graders, when they would come out, you know, what did they like best? And I always got two answers, going to the very top and outside and all around, walking around yeah. and talking to Emily. And I'm thinking, well, unfortunately, Emily is no longer with us. But I thought they'd say, I like a day out of school, you know. So, Bill, do you want to take that question next? What's your favorite part of your involvement? I would mirror a lot of what Bob said. I think the different people uh, that we get to meet uh, that come out in the lighthouse, but I, I would also add the volunteers. Uh, we have a really great group of people. We have a, a solid core of people who participate and uh, have an active interest. You know, that makes it very fulfilling. And as I often tell prospective volunteers, you know, there are worse things you could do on a sunny Saturday afternoon in July than be out on the water and uh, uh, taking people through a historic lighthouse. So how about you, Van? I've loved the, the river and the water my whole life. I'm a boater. My wife and I have an old tugboat. And um, I think of that lighthouse for me as a ship, a ship in the water. It's our ship out in the middle. And when I go there, I, I, I like to just lose myself in thinking about what it was like 150 years ago in America with uh, moving the goods and the boats and the harsh weather and how we handled it and what the amazing achievements we, we can do and have been able to do all of our lives. It just takes me back to a very meditative place, if you will. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful way of putting it. It's a fascinating lighthouse, a lot of great history on the, of the lighthouse itself and this, all the surroundings on the Hudson River. And uh, I want to thank all three of you for joining me today, uh, Van Calhoun, Bill Palmer, and Bob Taylor. And I want to wish you the best with the foundation renovation project. Uh, and uh, again, uh, people can go to HudsonAthensLighthouse.org. Uh, the website, uh, they can donate through the website, they can send a check, but uh, obviously like any uh, project like this, every dollar helps. Mm -hmm. yeah, Jeremy, can I yeah. uh, mention that if they do go to the website and are thinking of donating, they may want to go to the, the media button there, okay. and then videos, and they can actually see this LIDAR study 3D, and it's wonderful. It, it will really tell you your money's going to something terrific.
Excellent point. I'm glad you said that. And I recommend that everybody listening uh, check that out. So thank you for, for saying that. So again, I, I wish you all the best with this. And maybe uh, we can talk again sometime as the project moves forward. I'd like to, uh, to follow up on this. And I also want to mention again, Carol Gans, who helped uh, prepare us all for, for this and uh, is, uh, is a great help too. So Carol, again, is the president of your organization. So Bob, Bill, and Van, thanks so much. You're very welcome. Again, to learn more about the Hudson Athens Lighthouse Preservation Society, visit their website at HudsonAthensLighthouse.org. As Van Calhoun said in the interview, there are three excellent videos on the website, including one about the foundation renovation project. Watching it will give you a really good idea of how the foundation was constructed and the challenge the group is facing to preserve it. The next episode of Lighthearted will feature an interview with Kirby Eldridge, who was one of two Coast Guard keepers at isolated Boone Island Light Station in Maine during one of the worst storms in recorded history. Yes, uh, that episode will be posted this Sunday, June 27th, and it's co-hosted by my good friend Bob Trapani, Executive Director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. That'll be a good one. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about all things the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers. And don't forget that donations and memberships in the USLHS support this podcast and other preservation and education projects. And if you listen to us through Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. And if you have any suggestions for the podcast, you can email me at jeremy at uslhs.org. The American author Og Mandino once wrote, quote, I will love the light for it shows me the way, yet I will endure the darkness for it shows me the stars, unquote. As always, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light.